This is SSCG 9, Impeachment. Explain the impeachment and removal process and its use for federal officials as defined in the U.S. Constitution. The congressional power of impeachment originated in Great Britain. In the 1300s, partly as a consequence of the Magna Carta, Parliament created impeachment, bills of attainder, and bills of pains and penalties. The idea of trial by legislature came about because of the requirement for people charged with crimes to be tried by their peers. However, this effectively meant trial for the nobility through the House of Lords, which has retained a judicial role until very recently in the British system of government. Bills of attainder are related to taint of the blood punishments for treason or other serious crimes where the property of the convicted could be seized by the king or by the lord who granted the property. Titles of nobility would also be denied to subsequent heirs. The bills of attainder carried a capital sentence, while the lesser bills of pains and penalties gave lesser sentences. These bills require the House of Commons to pass a bill, with the House of Lords agreeing to it. Bills of attainder do not necessarily even require presentation of evidence, or even require granting the defendant a hearing. Through the bill, Parliament can even create a new crime and then punish individuals for committing that crime despite no known law being broken at the time. Bills of attainder and their lesser sibling did require royal assent by the king or queen in order for the sentence to be carried out. Bills of impeachment did not need the royal assent. Impeachment is a right of the House of Commons where any member may introduce a bill of impeachment. They are required to submit evidence, and then the House considers the matter. If the House votes to impeach, then the matter is carried to the House of Lords, where Commons acts as the accusers. Trial before the House of Lords resembles a criminal trial, where testimony and evidence are provided to the Lords. Both commoners and Lords may be tried by impeachment, but the general requirement of high crimes and misdemeanors became attached. Thus, impeachment in the British system became tied to charging and removing high officials from office for committing specified crimes. Bills of attainder and bills of impeachment usage waxed and waned depending on the politics of the time. Times of disorder especially resulted in these types of punishments. During times where Parliament was asserting its primacy, the Bill of Impeachment was favored, while the Bill of Attainder was more favored by the monarchs. Eventually, both became moribund in English constitutional history. The impeachment of Warren Hastings, Governor General of India, was one reason that impeachment fell into disfavor. It took seven years from arrest to acquittal for the impeachment. Another failed impeachment, ironically by one of the prosecutors of Hastings, Henry Dundas, in 1808, was the last time Parliament used this power. As cohesive parties arose and the power of kings to keep unpopular and corrupt ministers in office faded, parties acted to remove prime ministers and cabinet members through votes rather than impeachment. Ironically, the impeachment of Warren Hastings began when the Philadelphia Convention met in 1787. During the debate, the majority position was that it was necessary, especially to remove judges appointed for life tenure. A few felt that removal of the president should not be through impeachment, but rather through elections. Some protested that giving the legislature the power violated the separation of powers. But as most states already had impeachment as a means of removing officials, the convention decided to give the sole power to the legislature and adopted the British system of having the House of Representatives act as the accusers and the Senate acting as the trial court. These are the relevant passages contained in the U.S. Constitution regarding impeachment. As mentioned before, 
the relevant House committee, usually that of the House Judiciary, investigates the charges brought by a member. And if it finds the charges credible after acquiring evidence and testimony, then it drafts articles of impeachment which resemble a bill of indictment. The House specifies the high crimes and misdemeanors which the impeached is to have committed. Then the impeachment is voted upon by the House as a whole. Only a majority vote is required, and if successful, the House appoints a small group of members to act as managers for the impeachment process. These individuals prosecute the impeached official before the U.S. Senate. Any officer under the United States government can be impeached. In reality, only a few have been, as most resign before impeachment can occur. The Senate has the sole power to try the individual, and the one specification is that if the President is tried, then the Chief Justice of the United States presides, so as to avoid a conflict of interest if the Vice President did. Theoretically, a Vice President might be able to preside over their own impeachment, as the Constitution is silent over this situation. In order to keep impeachments from tying up the Senate, the Senate created Rule 11 in the 1930s, which allows the Senate to delegate its powers to try to a special committee created to hear evidence from the House managers and the defendant, which then reports to the Senate. Next, the Senate as a whole votes on impeachment and punishments based on the committee's report. This was challenged in a court case, and the Supreme Court upheld this procedure. President Clinton's impeachment was heard in its entirety by the whole U.S. Senate. Two-thirds of the Senate must vote to convict on any article of impeachment which automatically results in removal from office. Each senator is the sole judge of sufficiency of the evidence presented. The only penalty the Senate can impose is a permanent ban on holding any federal office in the future. For this reason, even someone who is out of office could theoretically be impeached for misconduct in office. Impeachment and removal as a civil procedure does not bar future criminal prosecution under the Double Jeopardy Clause. These are some of the more noteworthy and historical impeachments that have developed the institution of impeachment in the United States Congress. An early failed impeachment was that of Senator Blunt. For misconduct in office, Blunt was expelled by the required two-thirds of the Senate in 1797 after being impeached by the House. The Senate then decided to vote on whether to convict on impeachment, primarily to bar Blunt from future federal office. Under its presiding officer, Thomas Jefferson, the Senate decided it no longer had jurisdiction to impeach, as Blount was expelled before conviction, and dismissed the charges. Judge Pickering's impeachment came about because of his erratic behavior on the bench, such as cursing during trials, public drunkenness, and apparent mental instability. He was removed after conviction by the U.S. Senate during the Jefferson administration in 1803. The impeachment of Justice Chase came in 1805 when the political fight between the Federalist-dominated court system and the Democratic-dominated Congress came to a head. Justice Chase was impeached by the House for his alleged misconduct while sitting as a circuit judge in his rulings. The Senate Democrat majority split and did not convict Chase as enough members felt that he was being impeached for his Federalist politics rather than his judicial misbehavior. He was acquitted by the Senate. In an attempt to punish President Andrew Jackson, the Senate in 1836 voted to censure President Jackson for not giving requested documents to the U.S. Senate. As the Democrats felt that the censure was simply political theater by the Whig-controlled chamber, when the Democrats regained control of the Senate in 1837, they promptly voted to expunge the censure of Andrew Jackson in a party-line vote. Since then, censure by the Senate 
has only been used to punish its own members. The political nature of impeachment was once again apparent in the impeachment of President Andrew Johnson in 1868. The Republican-dominated Congress profoundly disagreed with Andrew Johnson's mild policies toward the defeated South after the Civil War. As the South was under military rule and President Johnson was commander-in-chief, the Congress sought to prevent the President from firing Secretary of War Edwin Stanton, who was for harsh treatment of the South. Congress passed the Tenure in Office Act over President Johnson's veto that prevented him from firing any executive official requiring Senate confirmation without the Senate's agreement to the official's firing. President Johnson fired Edwin Stanton and then the House moved immediately to impeach. The Senate ultimately failed to convict by one senator's vote which left Johnson as president. In an ironic twist, Andrew Johnson was selected after his term as president to be a senator from Tennessee. He entered the Senate chamber with cheers in 1875. President Nixon faced impeachment after burglars tied to his re-election campaign were arrested. Eventually the trail of evidence led to top officials of his White House and then President Nixon himself. President Nixon provided the key evidence against him and others when he was forced by a court order to turn over tape recordings in the Oval Office of his conversations with his aides. These clearly demonstrated President Nixon orchestrating a cover-up of his campaign officials' actions. Nixon's impeachment appeared likely and the House Judiciary Committee had drafted articles of impeachment dealing with Nixon's actions in office. Before the House could vote, Richard Nixon became the first president to resign from office, and subsequently the House took no further action. Nixon's successor as president, Vice President Gerald Ford, pardoned Nixon for all actions which ended any attempts to criminally prosecute Nixon for his actions. President Bill Clinton's impeachment stemmed from a special prosecutor appointed to investigate his actions in Arkansas and a civil suit for sexual harassment by a former state employee. The Supreme Court ruled in 1996 that the civil suit could go forward while Clinton was president. In the deposition, which is testimony in front of a judge and attorneys for each side, Bill Clinton did not answer truthfully as to whether he had inappropriate relations with an intern while in office. As the special prosecutor had evidence that Bill Clinton's statement to the court was untrue, he then investigated the president for perjury before the court. After providing the evidence to the House of Representatives in 1998 in a report, the House voted to impeach Bill Clinton for perjury and obstruction of justice in the affair. After the trial, where the Senate heard most evidence in secret session, the Senate failed to convict on both counts. President Clinton served out his remaining term. William Belknap was impeached but not convicted for alleged corruption in office. He resigned but was impeached anyway because of his resignation much like the impeachment of Senator Blount, the Senate failed to convict on all counts. However, this did establish the principle that even those that resign may still be impeached in order to bar them from future federal office based on their misconduct. The overwhelming number of impeachments address federal judges. As judges are appointed for life, the only way to remove them is through the impeachment process. Even conviction and being sentenced to jail may still leave a federal district court judge receiving pay and benefits. One such judge serving time, federal district court judge Walter Nixon, challenged his impeachment by the Senate in court. He alleged the Senate using a committee to hear evidence under Rule 11 violated his right to a trial before the full Senate. The Supreme Court in Nixon v. U.S. did not agree 
and held that the House and Senate have the sole power of impeachment, and can choose what procedures they deem necessary to impeach and try officials. This judge is no relative of President Nixon, by the way. Impeachments are rare and represent a hybrid between the criminal trial by legislature and a political process. The only punishments that the Senate can render are removal from office and perhaps a lifetime ban on holding federal office. Because of the separation of powers, neither the courts nor the president possess the power to stop, remedy, or redress impeachments, apart from the bare requirements of the Constitution. It is a legislative power only designed to remove office holders for misconduct. Sources for this module. Sources for images in this module. Sources for images in this module, page 2. Sources for images in this module, page 3. Additional resources for this module. This completes this content module.